Well, here we are with another month started and another opportunity to come to all our DCF friends with our DVD. Now, when we made the DVD last month, we had made it just with the Coleraine branch in mind. But it was our good friends, Desi and Margaret Russell, who came up with the idea of multiplying the ministry and sharing that little DVD with all the branches right throughout Northern Ireland and the many DCF friends that there are all across this land. So we are making this DVD this month to suit all of you. So it's really a generic DVD and we're excited about that, aren't we, Very Yvonne? Excited. I tell you, we really are. And we hope you are too. And so when you're listening and watching, just think that there are people in all different places and care homes and residential homes and in their individual homes who are watching this DVD and listening in. And we are excited about it. Now we've got a great program for you today. When we were setting up our rallies for this year, not knowing that there would be no rallies this year, we had picked some speakers to share and to sing in our Coleraine DCF branch. And one of those was Victor Hutchison. Now there was the Reverend Fred Greenfield and we have some others as well. So what we have for you today is an opening chorus or two, a lovely hymn that we're going to sing, and then Victor Hutchison with his accordion is going to play some songs and sing and bring a message from the Bible. And Yvonne is going to tell one of her hymn stories. I don't know if you've ever heard Yvonne's hymn stories. So you've got a hymn story for us I today, sure haven't have. you? That's great. Good one. Well, let's get going. Mm -hmm. And our first song that we want to sing for you today and for you to sing along with us is a great chorus, well known. What is the chorus, Mrs. Stewart? His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. <laughs> Get ready to sing. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. He is the mighty King, Master of everything. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord, He's the great shepherd, the rock of all ages. Almighty God is He. Bow down before Him, love and adore Him. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. Did you enjoy that? Well, if you enjoyed it as much as we did, we'd like to sing it with you one more time. So here you are. Sing up now. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. He is the mighty King, Master of everything. His name is wonderful, Jesus my Lord. He's the Great Shepherd, the Rock of all ages. Almighty God is He. And that's absolutely true. Isaiah the prophet said, His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. And that's true. Now, here's a great song. It's a chorus that you will know 
and we want you to really join in. If you want joy, real joy, wonderful joy, let Jesus come into your heart. If you want joy, real joy, wonderful joy, let Jesus come into your heart. If you want joy, real joy, wonderful joy, let Jesus come into your heart. Your sins he'll take away, your night he'll turn to day, your heart he'll make it over and you and then come in to stay. If you want joy, real joy, wonderful joy, let Jesus come into your heart. If you want joy, real joy, wonderful joy, let Jesus come into your heart. If you want joy, real joy, wonderful joy, let Jesus come into your heart. Your sins he'll take away, your night he'll turn to day. Wonderful joy, let Jesus come into your heart. What we're going to do now is to just uh, commit our service to the Lord in prayer. And would you please join with me as we lift up our hearts to the Lord and commit our ministry today to his help and his guidance. Our Father, we so rejoice and thank you this day in Jesus' precious name for the privilege of sharing the glorious gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we thank you today, Lord, for the great DCF family that's uh, spread all over our land and the many different branches and the different leadership groups and teams and all the ministry that goes on month by month even as we reflect back on the years that are gone. But this year, Lord, in the circumstances now, when we can't meet together as we usually do, we thank you that there's the opportunity of still hearing and still enjoying the ministry of Jesus Christ's word and his message. And we pray this day for all who are in ministry in DCF, those who are in the committee and those who share in regional responsibilities and our local teams, we thank you for them today. And then, Lord, there are those particular people that we know in different branches and in our own individual branches that are not well, who need your touch, who need your presence. Some may be lonely. And Lord, we pray that you will draw near to them and comfort them and give them a sense of your presence and companionship with them. We remember those who may be suffering pain and weakness today because of advanced years or because of physical illness. And we ask, Lord, today that you would just touch them in their bodies. Thank you today, Lord, for the privilege now of sharing and we pray that this message and ministry in a little while of Yvonne and then Victor as he sings and shares your word make this a, a great service for the glory of the Lord Jesus our great Savior. Bless our land today. Come to our nation today Lord we pray and give the leaders and uh, uh, those who are in responsible positions wisdom and authority to uh, choose the right decisions and to make right decisions. And please, Lord, deliver us, we ask, Lord, from this virus that is so prevalent so many places. Oh, Lord, we pray, turn us again mm -hmm. and draw near to us and visit us and bless us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
we've got a great hymn for you just now. And then after this, uh, Yvonne is going to share a very special story. And it's based on the hymn... I was going to keep that a secret. Whoa, it's, you better let it out it's now. It's based on the hymn, Jesus Loves Me. Now let's sing. I heard an old, old story, how a saviour came from glory. I heard an old, old story, how a saviour came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning, then I repented my sin and won the victory. Sing now. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again, and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, Dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory and i heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea about the angels singing and the old redemption story and some sweet day i'll sing up there the song of victory oh victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me ere i knew Plunge me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. And now Yvonne is going to share her story, and you will enjoy it very much, I'm sure. What do you think is the best loved children's hymn of all time? Or what hymn did you first learn as a child? Was it Jesus Loves Me, This I Know? It was written by Anna Bartlett Warner and soon after it was published in 1860 it became one of the most popular Christian hymns in churches around the world, especially among children. Born on Long Island, New York 
in 1827. Anna could trace her lineage on both sides back to the Puritan pilgrims. Her father was Henry Warner, a well-known New York City lawyer, originally from New England, and her mother was Anna Bartlett from a wealthy, fashionable family in New York's Hudson Square. When she was a young child, her mother died, and her father's sister Fanny came to live with them. Although Henry Warner had been a successful lawyer, he lost most of his fortune in the Panic of 1837. That was a very deep economic depression which lasted right through to the mid-1840s. And also in subsequent lawsuits and poorer investments. The family had to leave their mansion at St Mark's Place in New York and move to an old ramshackle Revolutionary War era farmhouse on Constitution Island near West Point, New York. She and her sister Susan became devout Christians in the late 1830s. Neither of them married, but they held Bible studies for the cadets of the US Military Academy, West Point, for over 40 years. Their uncle, the Reverend Thomas Warner, was the academy chaplain there. Anna wrote a new hymn for her Sunday school class each month. When they were on military duty, the cadets would sing, Jesus Loves Me. It is believed that Dwight D. Eisenhower was one of the last cadets to attend their classes. In 1849, because there was little change in their family's financial situation, Anna and her sister Susan started writing to earn money. She wrote 31 novels on her own. The two young women were very talented writers and in 1859 they published a novel together entitled Say and Seal. It became a bestseller. However, even the very best of novels remained popular for only a limited time and Say and Seal eventually went the way of all the rest. But as long as Jesus Loves Me is still sung by children, it will never be entirely forgotten. The poem, which became a hymn, first appeared within the pages of the Warner Girls novel. Let me give you a little bit of the storyline. Two of the characters, Faith and John, are greatly concerned for a very sick little fellow named Johnny Fax. Johnny's condition became critical and he asked Mr Linden, his Sunday school teacher, to take him up in his strong arms and comfort him. Mr Linden readily does so and, picking up the feverish and very sick little boy, walks slowly back and forth across the room trying to console him. Suddenly Johnny pleads, Sing! As Faith listens, she hears Mr. Linden sing a beautiful song which neither she nor Johnny have ever heard before. Jesus loves me, this I know. With this he sought to comfort the final moments of the dying lad. Indeed, a few hours later, little Johnny Fax went to be with the Lord, the one who loved him so much. The lines of the poem came to the attention of the famous composer William Bradbury and in 1861 he set them to music and added the chorus Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. It was a favourite hymn of Francis Schaeffer, a 20th century American evangelical theologian, philosopher and pastor. He recognised that ultimately what intellectuals and children alike need is the simple message of Jesus and his love. Amy Carmichael, the Irish missionary to India, was converted after hearing this hymn sung at a children's mission in Yorkshire in England. Now many stories have grown up around this song. Here are just a few of them. Some years ago, a church in Atlanta, Georgia, 
was honouring one of its senior pastors, who had been retired many years. After a warm welcome, the 92-year-old speaker was introduced. As the applause died down, he rose from his high-backed chair and walked slowly with great effort to the podium. Without a note or written paper of any kind, he placed both hands on the pulpit to steady himself, and then, quietly and slowly, he began to speak. When I was asked to come here today and talk to you, your pastor asked me to tell you what was the greatest lesson I ever learned in my 50 years of preaching. I thought about it for a few days and boiled it down to just one thing that made the most difference in my life and sustained me through all my trials. The only thing that would comfort me was this verse that I learned as a child. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Now the next story comes from China. At the height of the persecution in communist China, a Christian sent a message to a friend. The message escaped the attention of the censors because it said simply, The this I know people are well. But that phrase, the this I know people, clearly identified the Christian community in China. It assured the friend that the church in China was alive and well. Now, there's another little one here, and it's come to my attention. The story is told about an occasion when a famous theologian was asked, What is the most profound thought that ever entered your mind? After a brief moment of reflection, he replied, The most profound thought I have ever known is the simple truth that Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Now there have been very, a number of other verses added to it, but I've asked Mildred to sing the original ones. Why not sing along with her now? She sings Jesus Loves Me. Jesus loves me, this I know. loves me he who died heaven's gate to open wide he will wash away my sin let his little child come in yes Jesus loves me yes Jesus loves me yes loves me the Bible tells me so Jesus loves me he will stay close beside me all the way if I love him when I die he will take me home heart of mine make it pure and holy thine thou hast bled and died for me I will henceforth live 
Thank you so much, Yvonne, for that. We really appreciate you sharing today, and we thank you for your ministry to us. Now it's my special joy and privilege to hand over the rest of our DVD today, Ministry, by Mr. Victor Hutchison from Coleraine. Many of you have heard Victor, many of you know him, and you have heard his messages and song before. But he is our special guest today. And so, Victor, come right on and share with us now in our program. Thank you so very much. Good evening, folks. Lovely to be here to share with you in this meeting. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Do you know that it's a wonderful thing today? There are so many inventions so many things that are being created by both men and women. But there's nothing as great as the fact that the Lord who created this universe loved you and me so much that he gave his only beloved son. It's the greatest wonder of them all. Wonders in this world I know upon. There's rivers, mountains, waterfalls, you can see them all around. There's towns and there are cities with their buildings big and small. But listen while I tell you the greatest wonder of them all. Oh, God loves you and me so much that he gave his only son. And he loves you, my brother, like you are the only one. You can keep on drifting, but you've got to make a start. You get down upon your knees, get this wonder in your heart. Now I see planes that fly so high above the speed of sun. And I see lots of coal mines drilling deep into the ground. But I don't care how deep you go, how high you reach your ball You can never tell the height and depth of God and His great love Oh, God loves you and me so much that He gave His only Son And He loves you, my sister, like you are the only one you can keep on drifting, but you've got to make a start. You get down upon your knees, get this wonder in your heart. Now man has split the atom and released tremendous power. He's climbed the highest mountains out upon the earth at all. But we're heading for destruction, brother, that is plain to see. Unless you trust this wonder, Jesus died for you and me. Oh, God loves you and me so much that he gave his only son. And he loves you, my brother, like you are the only one. You can keep on drifting, but you got to make a start. You get down upon your knees, get this wonder in your heart. Yes, it's about getting this wonder in your heart. I don't like waiting much. If I'm in a queue, I want the queue to go quicker. But you know... Jesus is waiting for maybe many of you. He's waiting for you to put your faith and trust in him. God has done all that is necessary. Now he's waiting for you. Jesus is waiting. Jesus is waiting, patiently still. Heaven with sinners may fill, washed in his blood, they're fast pressing in, leaving you lost in darkness and sin. 
loved ones are waiting. Think of the tears shed over you with anguish and fear. Think of their cry as once more they pray. Lord, save them now, why still it is there, waiting for you, yes, waiting for you, others have come, but what about you, oh, you'd not linger if you but knew, Jesus is waiting, waiting. Oh sinner thing, you are now standing just on the brink. Only one step, the line will be crossed. Only one step, then forever lost. Jesus is waiting, hear it again. No longer waiting in vain. Once more he calls you, once more may say, Jesus is waiting, come while you may. He's waiting for you, yes, waiting for you. Others have come, but what about you? Yes, Jesus is waiting for you. We're going to share a few thoughts now from the Word of God. We're turning to Genesis chapter 50. Just a few wee verses from 15 through to 21. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, Perhaps Joseph will hate us. And he may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. So they sent messengers to Joseph, saying, Before your father died, he commanded, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. Now please forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we are your servants. Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good to bring to pass as it is this day to save many people alive. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. And we know that God will add his blessing to the reading of his wonderful word. The story of Joseph starts in Genesis 37. And we're introduced to him as a young lad of 17. We're introduced as well to a family with problems. Brought on probably by dad's showing of affection for Joseph over and above the other children that he had. It created a problem. The brothers didn't like him. They were angry with him at times. They didn't speak kindly to him. It was a disturbed family unit. And then he had his dreams. Well, if the first dream didn't make them any happier, definitely the second one was far more of a problem. They really hated Joseph. 
To add to it all, his dad made him a coat of many colours, different than all the rest. Sometimes, as parents and grandparents, we can be guilty of creating problems in our families. And that's what happened here. But Joseph, you know, grew up with many, many wonderful attributes. His obedience for his father is exemplified whenever the brothers were sent away to take the flocks away to get them fed. Joseph was kept at home. But his dad said to him one day, Joseph, I would like you to go to your brothers and possibly take them some food or find out how everything is with them. And scripture does not show that Joseph in any way denied his dad's request. In fact, it gives the impression that he was so obedient, he went straight away. And remember, he was going to brothers that he knew hated him, but he did what his father told him. The brothers saw him coming, and they thought, here's our chance to get rid of him. He's far away from home. We will do something to him. They even thought of killing him. Hatred is such a problem. Reuben said, no, 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 you can't do that. So what they did, they put him in a pit. And then they saw their opportunity. They saw the Ishmaelites coming with a train, not a train as we know it, but a camel train. And they thought, hey, what we'll do, we will sell him, we'll make some money. And to cover it, the fact of what they were doing, they took his coat from him, they slew one of the animals and put the blood on the coat, knowing that his dad would recognise the coat very quickly and very clearly and it would give him the impression that a wild animal had got Joseph and that he was dead. Hatred is such a terrible thing and people allow it sometimes to fester in their lives, creates many problems for them and for those around them. But they took their step of selling him down into slavery, into Egypt. Potiphar came along and thought this would make an excellent slave for him. And he bought him and took him to his own home. Now it would have been very easy, would it not? And maybe if you and I had been in his situation, we would have felt very sorry for ourselves. How terrible, I have done nothing wrong. And here I am, sold into slavery, away from my home. Maybe never see my dad again, the one whom I love so much. It must have been terrible for him. But you know, what we see in Scripture is something very wonderful. Even in slavery, Joseph took the opportunity of using the positives of his personality to work in Potiphar's house to such an extent that Potiphar saw that what he did was good. And Joseph seems to have taken the chance as well of sharing his faith because Potiphar gave the glory to God. You can read it in scripture. He worked hard. Potiphar enjoyed having Joseph around the house. He gave him full responsibility of everything that would on his house. All the ordering, all the supplies, everything that had to be done. Joseph did it for Potiphar and Potiphar was well pleased. Unfortunately, Potiphar's wife didn't have the same feelings for Joseph and she told a lie on him that led to him being put into prison. Much and all as Potiphar had enjoyed having Joseph around, much and all has he respected this man. Whenever his wife said the accusation, Potiphar immediately banished him into prison. It's getting worse for Joseph, is it not? First of all, he's sold into slavery. Now he's down into prison. It's getting worse. Oh, you and I again. We would have been sitting probably saying, this is so unfair. This is terrible. There's no way I'm going to do anything for anybody. This is just terrible. My life is ruined. This is dreadful. Joseph wasn't like that at all. He began helping other prisoners. He began helping the warden of the prison. He began doing things for them. And he was recognised as a helpful, kind person. 
the jailer gave him responsibilities round the jail and that meant that he had the opportunity of going round the prisoners, of helping them with the food distribution and doing different things for them and talking to them and hearing about their problems and hearing about their lives. The butler and the baker thrown into prison. And he came to them and he saw them and they said, Joseph, we have got a problem. We both have had dreams and we don't understand what they mean. And we've been talking to a few folks here and nobody can tell us what the meaning of these dreams is. And Joseph took the opportunity to witness to God. He said, it is God that will give you the understanding for your dreams. That wasn't easy to do, was it? Oh yes, he had faith in God and he believed in God. But couldn't they have said back to him, If you believe in this God, why are you here in this prison? Why are you not free? If this God is so powerful and so wonderful, why are you here? It doesn't seem to be right. It didn't mean that he held back from witnessing. He said, tell me your dreams. And so they told him what they had dreamed. And he said, well, to the butler... In three days, you're going to be allowed out of prison. Your life will change. You'll be back at your old job and things will be wonderful for you. The baker, when he heard this, he thought, great. I had a three days in mine too. I'm going to tell him my dream. And so the baker told his dream, but it wasn't as good for him, was it? The baker learned that in three days that he was to die. For the crimes, whatever they were, justified or otherwise, it didn't matter. Joseph said to him, three days you will be killed, you will be executed. Now there's only one wee glimmer here in Genesis 40, verse 14 and 15, of Joseph feeling a wee bit as if this is not right. Because it says in those two verses that he said to the butler, whenever you get out, please tell Pharaoh that I'm here. I haven't done anything wrong to deserve the fact of why I'm here. Please tell him so that something can be done to get me out. The butler said, yes, of course I will. I will tell him. He had heard the dream. It was going to be a wonderful ending to it. You would have thought that he would have remembered. It would probably have been the worst, first thing that he would have said. But he forgot. In Genesis 40, in verse 23, it says, The butler forgot. He didn't remember. All of the good things were in his mind, and the thought of telling Pharaoh about Joseph completely slipped his mind. But friends, if he had have remembered at that time, it would not have been the right time. Because if we have a family with problems, we have a God who has a plan. And God's preparation for that plan was during this time in prison for Joseph. It took two years before Pharaoh had his dream. Nobody could understand the dream. And here is the significance, is it not, why the two years had to happen. Because when Pharaoh had his dream, it was then that the butler remembered about his dream and about the fact that Joseph in prison had told him the meaning of his dream. He was quick to go to Pharaoh and say, look, whenever I was in prison, I had this dream and there was a prisoner there with us. And he was able to explain the dream to me and what he said actually happened. I believe that he could tell you the meaning of your dream too. They brought Joseph out of prison. Now he's standing in front of the very highest of the land. One thing to testify to two fellow prisoners. Surely a different thing to stand in front of the head of the land and say about God. But Joseph didn't hesitate. Whenever Pharaoh said to him, I believe that you're someone who can interpret dreams. What was Joseph's response? He said, it is not I. It is God that gives the meaning to dreams. And Pharaoh told him his dream. And Joseph gave him the explanation to the dream. 
Joseph said, you need to put somebody in authority to cover all these years that are going to happen and all the famine and everything. And Pharaoh said, well, there's none better than you. And so he got the job. Didn't take a big interview for that job application, did it? He got the job. And he was so instrumental in providing for many, many people, even those who were further away. Indeed, his own family. They were sent down into Egypt. Their food had run out. Their dad sent the brothers down into Egypt and said, Go down into Egypt and tell them there that we have great need and get some food that we can exist, that we can keep going. And so the brothers went down. It's a lovely story. I love the story. Joseph saw them and recognised them straight away and his heart broke for them. But he tested them. And they come through the testing, didn't they? And then the verses that we read together were the verses that showed how he demonstrated his love for them. He said, I'm your brother Joseph that you sold into Egypt. They were concerned. They thought in the verses we read that whenever dad had died that they were going to be punished. And Joseph said, no. You meant it for evil. But God meant it for good, to bring to pass it is this day, to save many people alive. He forgave them. He saw it was part of God's plan and purpose to come through all the prison, to come through the slavery, everything. He didn't see it in any way as a negative aspect of his life. It was God's preparation for him, for the job that he had for him. It was God's plan and purpose. And it was being fulfilled. Let's reflect on that verse a little further. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. To bring to pass as it is this day, to save many people alive. Let's bring it up to Christ. There was many who were there at the crucifixion who were angry with Jesus, who wanted him killed, they wanted him crucified, they shouted, crucify him, he's a troublemaker, get rid of him. But you know, dear friends, can't we quote that verse again for here? You meant it for evil as he looked down upon them there at the cross. But God meant it for good to bring to pass it is this day to save many people alive. And not only the people of his time, but God has been saving people ever since. People who realise that his death on Calvary's cross was part of God's plan and purpose, was part of God's preparation, was part of your opportunity to find a way to spend eternity with the Heavenly Father, with Jesus his Son and with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to finish our time together with a little piece entitled A Plan Fulfilled. That is God's plan and purpose, is it not? That Jesus should die so that you could have salvation. A plan fulfilled. <laughs> A boy was born in Bethlehem long many years ago. His mother, as she worked at home, was told it would be so. Then from an early age she knew that he came from above to dwell. And tell to all the wonders of God's love. At the early age of thirty three, he died on Calvary. He shed his blood, he suffered pain, and he did it all. Praise the Lord, salvation it is free. And soon I'll go to dwell with him for all eternity.
Let's unite our hearts in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your precious word. We thank you for the stories that we can read in your word that are true and that demonstrate so wonderfully your love for mankind. We thank you, Lord, for this story that we've shared tonight about Joseph and particularly how your son, Jesus Christ, fulfilled a plan and purpose too. He was nailed to a cross, but it was for your plan and purpose. It was so that you could demonstrate your love for us so wonderfully, so that you would give all mankind the opportunity of coming and placing their faith and trust in you. May your spirit have liberty in the lives of those who listen. May they be blessed as they come and place their faith and trust in you. May believers be blessed, Lord, as they walk daily with you. We ask it all in the Saviour's name. Amen. Keep safe and God bless you all. Amen.